Our exhortation today will be provided by our brother David Stanley, and his title is, I Chose You Out of This World. And in preparation for his remarks, he's asked that we read from the book of John, chapter 2. Oh, I'm sorry, 1 John. That's an important part. 1 John, chapter 2. Verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abideth forever. We'll now give our attention to Brother David for his remarks on I chose you out of this world. It was getting a little bit dry. Uh, well, good morning, brothers and sisters and friends of the truth. It's good to see so many here this morning. It's wonderful to see you. As our brother read from the words of John's first epistle, love not the world, neither the things in this world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Love not the world. That's what we've been commanded. Why not love the world? I mean, God loved the world so much that he gave Jesus, his only begotten son. Jesus commanded us, out of love, to to go into all the world and preach the good news. We're told to love others or to show that concern and compassion that we see in Jesus himself. And we know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and for others. And God has created this world with fascinating beauty. We can find great pleasure and satisfaction in just looking at the elements of his creation, the, the mountains, the, the, the flowers, the trees, the animals, even the people. Wasn't the world made by God? And doesn't the Bible say, and God say, saw everything that he had made and it was very good? Well, of course, of course it does. And, and we know that this, this passage is, is not talking about the physical creation, right? And John supplies the The answer in the verses that follow, he says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life is not of the Father, that's of the world. You see, he's talking about an attitude of rebellion against God, you know, this, the the worldly ambition, the vanity, the the pride, all this stuff that permeates our society, all the things that trap us into forgetting God, it makes us kind of almost antagonistic towards his will. Those are the things of the world that we are to love not. In 2 Peter chapter 1, says it's the corruption that is in the world through lust, which is to be shunned. All that, you know, all that man-made evil that pollutes the world. And Paul says in his letter to the Galatians chapter six, he that soweth to his flesh 
his, you know, his sinful side, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So as children of God, we know that we've died in essence to this old life of the world. And we've been born again of water and of spirit. And we've been born that way through his word. And so now we have to be as, as children of God, sons and daughters of God, we must be led by the spirit, not by the flesh. And, and we must look on other people and, and we look at them with purity, not with unbridled passion, you know. And we need to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. So what I'm going to show you next several passages, it talks about our relationship with the world. And this is scripture plainly drawing a distinction between the fact that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. In John 17, in his wonderful prayer, Jesus prays for those of us who are in the world working for his purpose. He says, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. He says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I'm coming to you. Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. And then we jump down to verse 14. He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Why? For they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. My prayer is not that you should take them out of the world, but that you protect them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He says, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. It's for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be sanctified through the truth. So we are not of the world. And we read in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. You know, recently I was reading an article, and it's a, it's a photocopy of a article, short article from a past edition of the Bible magazine. And so I don't know who the author was, unfortunately. But I came across a quote that was addressing this very issue. And so I put some of it up on the board. The writer says, yet this foolishness, this philosophy and thinking has gained a stranglehold on society. It has resulted in political correctness, multiculturalism, revisionist history, and discovery learning. You may be familiar with some of those phrases. It is manifest in the breaking of family life. It's immoral laws and behavior, as well as in a phenomenal crime rate and violence. There is a darkness that covers the earth. How true that is. Essentially, truth is whatever you believe. Kind of echoes the words of Pontius Pilate in, uh, in John 18, where he says, talking to Jesus, what is truth, right? I mean, what does it matter? And the verse just before that in John 18, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight and that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom, kingdom not from hence. We see that Jesus gave himself for our sins 
that he might deliver us from the present evil of this world. All according to the will of his God, his Father. James chapter 4 tells us that we are not to be friends with the world. He says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. In the very popular passage in uh, Romans 12, Paul writes, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I've said this before. I know I was talking to Randy about it just, just the other week. This transformation that he's talking about is not a matter of tweaking our fleshly character. It's a metamorphosis. That's, that's the word that's being used. You see, we are being changed into something new. It's a new creation that's happening. And in the meantime, we are in the world, right? I think we, there's no questioning that. Christ sent his apostles, and, and therefore us, brothers and sisters, into the world to preach hope, to preach the hope of life eternal. But we are not to be, again, of the world. We are to bring others out of the world and bring them into Christ. So he says in John 15, I chose you out of this world. Starting in verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you. Take it personally. Out of this world. That is why the world hates you. And having been chosen or separated out of this world, we are to keep ourselves, as James says, unspotted from the world. So, question is, how can we be separated unto God and love not the world? How can we do that? Well, I was thinking about this. I spent a number of years uh, consulting, a uh, consulting company. And... The client many times would say, I, I feel like I'm paying you for telling me things I already know. I think you can probably, maybe you can appreciate that. And that's really the approach I'm taking with this talk. Okay? You're not paying me, but I'm telling you things that you already know. We know about scripture. We know about God's commands, don't we? I mean, none of these passages that I just put up on the screen are probably new to you. At least the, the concepts aren't new, right? The objective this morning is to help us refocus on what is most important to each one of us. That is serving God now and preparing to serve in his kingdom. And so we want to set a plan for reaching those two goals. To do the will of God, to love not the world, but to love God and overcome the desires of the flesh and to stay unspotted from the temptations of this world. So how do we do it? How can we be separated from God, unto God and love not the world? Well, I think the first thing that came to my mind is we really need to understand the concept of what it means to be set apart, right? That's what a lot of, this is the, the foundation. And so we pick up, and this is an example from Ephesians chapter one, the introductory verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus. 
and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now you notice the word saint, and we know this. Saints, some, I mean sacred, or holy, or set apart. This is holiness by association, okay? We're set apart. We're called to some special work for God. You remember the vessels of the temple were holy. The altar was holy. The high priest, he was holy because of his calling and his appointment. This I'm calling holiness by association. And then we move into chapter 5 of Ephesians, and, and we read things like, in verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. As becometh saints. I believe this describes holiness by achievement. And it only applies to people. So being holy by association we should seek to match that condition by a life of active holiness, by our actions. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, he writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Beseech you to walk, dealing with personal conduct. You see, the main purpose of this letter to the Ephesians is to urge a personal and practical application of being set apart from the world and set unto God. Continue down to verse 23. It says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I want you to notice the phrasing again. Put on the new man. Righteousness and holiness. This instructs us that in all that we do, we must have a rightness of conduct, but it must spring forth from a rightness of character. See, being holy, being separate, involves resisting the things that war against our desire to serve God. The a father and his son, young son, were looking at a painting that portrayed Christ standing and knocking at a shut door. And the boy says to his father, why don't they open the door? The father replies, I don't know, son. Perhaps they can't hear the knocking. After a little while, the boy says, oh, I know why they can't hear the knocking. They're living in the basement. If you, if you want to live a holy life, separate from the things of this world, you first need to give up living part-time if you are in a spiritual basement where all the low, all the base things of the world exist. Keep that in mind. You know, in the first century Ecclesia, they would have been surrounded by Greek gods, right? Greek mythology, all this worship. And, and they would have seen like um, Hercules, Theseus, right? They, you may remember those uh, from school. They were always you know, fighting through all these uh, beasts in order to get to the final battle against the Minotaur, right? And, and then they would receive this great reward. John tells us we only have one opponent. And, and that opponent's very easy to find because it's ourselves. The ways and desires of our flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And we sin when we give birth to one of these worldly desires. James, and we know this, James tells us in the first, first chapter, but each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed, right? Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, 
gives birth to death, echoing Romans 6. So love not the world. Be separate from the world. Be a stranger and sojourner. It's your decision. So how, how do we do it? You know, one thing we could do, and you'll see I've kind of started a list. We could come up with a list of things that we might struggle with, right? So here's a sample. And you notice I've got two different columns here. The things you must not do and things you must not do too much, right? And, it's, it, it, and you'll, you'll see as I go through it, you know, you must not murder, steal, lie, covet, seek selfish ambition, you know, sow discord or you know, causing dissension, get drunk, hate your brother and sister. You must not do those. You can find that, that's easy to pull out of scripture. You don't have to leave Exodus. Then there's some that aren't inherently bad, unless you do it too much. Television, social media. I'm kind of tempted to move that to the other column actually, but we'll leave it there for, you know, for spacing purposes. Sports, hobbies, you can see them, you know, work, education, love of self, love of family. And the thing is, this is only a partial list. I mean, we could probably fill up these walls and those at home could fill up your walls too and, he, and we'd probably run out of room. And not all of these apply to us, to each one of us, but probably quite a few do, if we're honest. And yet the don't do too much, I think, is often more difficult to overcome than the don't do it alls for the very nature of, they're not necessarily horrible, you know, in moderation sometimes. And the thing is, it affects everyone, regardless of, of age or sex or affluence. We're all guilty. We're all susceptible. And when it comes to sin, the world wants you wants us to blame others, right? But I'm telling you, it's a you problem. It's a me problem. We're not here this morning. You know, this isn't like a, you're attending an intervention for the person next to you, right? I think we all know that. Do you, do you ever find there's a sharp contrast between your secular activities in the world and your spiritual ones? Ask yourself three questions. First of all, does what I'm doing prepare me for God's kingdom? Second, can I offer it to God as service? And third, can I ask God to bless it? Remember, you are what you eat, right? You've heard, we've all familiar with that phrase. Well, in the same way, you come, you become like the God that you serve. We have to flee from temptation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul tells us to flee from a, a lot of things. He says you, to flee from sexual immorality. Chapter 10 Flee from idolatry, idolatry, then free from controversies and quarrels, envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions. But you, man or woman of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. We know what our temptations are, and they're different depending on the person. But you know what? I, I think it's pretty seldom, I think you would agree with this, that, that you stop in your tracks and go, wow, who knew I'd be tempted by that, right? We generally know what all of our temptations are. So one thing we can do is we can make a list of things to avoid, right? 
I grew up in a uh, strong Southern Baptist environment. A wonderful, wonderful family. I mean, I love to this day, just some of the most wonderful people I've, I've, I've ever known. And we had a number of preachers going back in our family. And the focus at that time tend, uh, tended to be negative scripture, you know, from the, the pulpit, we'll say. I, I grew up where they said, don't dance. Don't listen to that devil's music. You know, you're going to go to hell if you do this or if you do that. Right. And I see some nods. I mean, I think I wasn't alone in that. By the time I was a teenager, I felt like I was giving this devil guy, you know, a bad name. Felt like, you know, I'm making him work overtime. Now, I admit that was that's the extreme. That was the extreme. And it scared me. It did. I mean, I could go through thoughts that I had at the time. I mean, nothing bad, but just like, it scared me. But it didn't make me do the right things. It just made me not want to do anything. Because it might be wrong. So only trying to not do the wrong things, if you follow that, that's not the answer, is it? So what is the answer? Well, I played a lot of sports. I know Daryl knows that. He was in there with me for a lot of things. No comment about how good we were, but we were involved in a lot of sports. And I was taught by a series of coaches how to be successful at a particular sport. That was their, their goal. And they generally didn't get us to practice not doing something, right? He didn't say, David, now I want you to take your eye off the ball a few times so you'll know how not to do that, right? Yeah, on a sharp grounder, you know, back up and let the ball play you so you can feel what it's like to hit yourself on the chin with the ball. Yeah, make sure you overrun second base, right? Or in, in football, carry the football out like this a few times going through the line. Uh, we were made aware of the mistakes that we didn't want to make so we could try to prevent them. So it's good to have the list of what not to do. But what we did do was we spent our time practicing what we needed to do to be successful. Watch the ball all the way in your glove, right? Come in on a grounder so you can take it on the right hop. Learn to slide into second. Tuck the football so, so it can't be knocked loose. So those are just examples. But we, sh we should each have a list of temptations or things to avoid, things that are specifically customized to you. Be self-aware. Have the guts, really. Have the guts to be honest with yourself. Tell yourself, I know that's a weakness. Let me admit it to myself. I mean, things like, do, do you want to serve God, but maybe only as an advisor to him? Yeah. Maybe you're not prone to murder, but maybe you have an affinity for gossip. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. So. I should look at, look at the, the camera. If you are, put it on the list. You know, maybe you tend to stir things up a bit. That's your, that's your personality. Well, maybe that could be uh, leading to dissension and discord. Recognize if you've got an addiction to social media or, or a gaming site and put that on your list. You know, maybe if you're a successful person in business, you're climbing the corporate ladder at the expense of your family. Turn it down a notch and list it. If you watch too much TV, drink too much alcohol, envy what others have, list, list, and list. And once you have your list, I would encourage you to keep it updated and then seize the opportunity to focus on the things that you should do. And you'll notice they're often in contrast to what you must not do, all right? So you can see the, the list up there on the right, yet cherish life. Give to others, revere the truth. 
Be content with God, what God's given you. Seek the best for others. Seek peace. Be sober. Love your neighbor. You see the contrast to the column on the left. But what's really interesting is that we only have a finite amount of time to do anything, right? I have not, we joke about a week stretcher or a day stretcher, but we only have a certain amount of time to do anything. So the more time that we dedicate to the things that we should do, the less time we have to mess up, right? I mean, it's, it's simple math, really. Because remember, they, there's a saying that, you know, opportunity may only knock once, but temptation bangs on the front door forever. If you live long enough, you, you understand that. And lots of times, it's easier to resist temptation and stay focused on the things of God if you're teamed up with another brother or sister. Especially if that brother or sister is your partner in the truth. And the thing is, don't expect to go from worldly to godly in under 60 seconds, right? But set your bar high. You should expect a lot from yourself because God does, if for no other reason. Now, we can do the right thing for many reasons. We can do the right thing out of self-interest or out of pity, right? We could do it out of loyalty or self-fulfillment. But remember what I said earlier, <clears throat> right conduct must be done with the rightness of character, the character of Christ. We're told by their fruits, you shall know them. You know, I want you to remember the saying, you may have heard it before, forbidden fruit creates many jams, right? You, you may have heard that. And, and it's so true. It causes so many problems. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. See, holiness bears fruit. And again, it doesn't come overnight, does it? I mean, it takes time to grow. I think it helps me when I think about the fruit growing process. You know, you, uh, you know I do a lot of gardening, I always have. I've done a lot of farming in the past. And you see, it, you have the bud and then the blossom all before you see any fruit. But the key is in your life, you should always see progress. You know, I was thinking about, you know, a two-year-old child might be a perfect child, right? But if that two-year-old perfection is still there five years later, you've got a problem. It's called arrested development. As you increasingly fill your life with the things of God and reject the, the lures of the world, you're going to see that development. You're going to witness it in your life. Character is formed out of our conduct. If so, if you want to, if you want to love your neighbors, start by acting out of love, sincerely. If you want, if you want to be trustworthy, then focus on receiving that trust from other people and revering that trust whenever you receive it. Now, one thing you can try to do is this. Every morning in prayer, this is the best time I find for me, rededicate yourself to God's service, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. I mean, set, reset your mind. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Love thy neighbor. Encourage each other. Search the scriptures daily. Pray regularly. Pray earnestly. Now, that's what I try to focus on in my prayer to start off my day. But here's a list I just came up with, uh, and, and I really did this from observing other people more than myself. But it's a list of additional ways that we can serve God. You can see them up there. Through your family. Serving God starts with serving in our own families. You know, through our tithes and offerings, or, or maybe visiting somebody who's sick, 
or somebody who's you know, elderly. Just be a friend to someone. Be willing to teach the children. Mourn with those who mourn. Share your talents or your creativity that God has given you. Do simple acts of service in the truth. You can serve God through outreach and sometimes just through humbling yourself before God and, and with your brothers and sisters. You see, living according to the Spirit versus living according to the world is not a complex decision. But it is a decision that you and I must make. Go back to one last example of um, my sports and had a coach. I won't, his initials were Ted Salmon. Uh, <coughs> hard, hard, school, hard knocks. He used to get us all a bit, about six or seven of us in a, in a group, in a circle. And he would throw the football in the middle. And the person that came out with the football was the only one that didn't have to run about a half a mile in pads. And you'd come back and do it again. I remember one time I was just, that was the smallest one against guys that were some, sometimes much larger. And he asked, why don't you, why don't you get the ball? I said, I, I, I'm trying. He goes, you don't want to? You don't want it? I said, yeah, I want it. He says, you don't want it bad enough. If you wanted it bad enough, you would have it. How much do you want to serve God? How bad do you want it? You're the only way to answer it. Leviticus 11, 43, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. Our vision, our calling is to be holy, is to be set apart for God. This is what we should seek to attain. And as disciples of Christ, in light of the calling that we received, and in response to the command that we live life that becomes a saint, right? You remember that? We need to first identify those things of the world that hinder our focus on God and blur our vision of this coming kingdom that we're looking for. And we need to press on to do the will of our Father in heaven. So let the thoughts of Paul, I'll pull it up in Philippians 3, be our thoughts. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Overcoming the lust of this world is not easy. God promises a safe landing, but he doesn't promise us a calm passage, does he? And we have Jesus to calm the storms. Paul encourages us. He says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And Jesus promises to him who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne. And I, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Brothers and sisters, in those difficult times, just remember that the task ahead of us is never as great as the power behind us.